reason that somebody as cool as myself and somebody as cool as Kathleen are obsessed with poop, and clearly there are a few other people in the world, we couldn't get them all in this room tonight, that are obsessed with poop. Um, and I'm just glad there's the word poop in the title. It, it was kind of hard for our communications and marketing department to, to buy into that, but they bought into it, we're fully behind it, and I hope somebody's gonna take a picture tonight, because I'm gonna send it across the street tomorrow morning, for sure. So welcome everyone to our final lecture of the fall season. I'm so pleased that all of you could make it. Um, I hope we don't make this just one hot box here tonight. So try and just, you know, shallow breathing, shallow breathing. No. <laughs> keep it cool, keep it cool. We'll keep the, we'll keep the back door open. Um, as many of you know, generous support from the Lowell Institute, we love the Lowell Institute, allows the aquarium and many other institutions. We actually have brochures outside that say um, the Lowell Institute, it's a blue brochure. Many other institutions in the city of Boston and Massachusetts are able to offer free lectures um, like the ones we offer. Um, and it's just awesome that we can off offer them for you, the general public. My name is Sunny, and I run the lecture series here, and Ashley is somewhere around here. My front kick, she'll be in here shortly. Um, just a quick survey. How many of you are members of the aquarium? Raise your hand. Okay, great. And how many of you, this is your first time to an aquarium lecture? First timers. Awesome. Fantastic. Great. Well, just a few announcements. If you're not on our email list, you can sign up out in the hall. There's a little sign-up sheet out there. And um, if you are registered, um, thank you for checking your name off the list. If you didn't, if you could just do so right before you leave, that would be great. Um, some of you also probably have little slips of paper. Those are just surveys um, that I take after each lecture. If you could just let me know what you thought of tonight's speaker and topic, that really helps us to sort of plan lectures for the future. Um, <laughs> Heavy on knowledge, light on the earth, we offer recycling and composting. The compost bin is the gray trash can, and there's a big sign on, that says what you can compost. Um, so if you do have any questions about that, just let me know. Feel free to sit and think in front of the compost bin before you throw it. Um, and also feel free to bring your own mug. I know it's the last lecture of the series, but if you're planning on attending next spring, and I hope you are, feel free to bring your own mug. That is welcome as well. Uh, for my last announcement, um, it is with both sadness and exciting anticipation <laughs> that I announce my departure from the New England Aquarium. Um, I wrote all this down so I could stay focused and not cry, but um, it's been an honor. <sighs> Dang it! <laughs> what is this? It's been an honor and a pleasure to serve all of you. Um, <laughs> I've been so good all week, okay. Um, as well as all of our fantastic speakers. Um, this part of my job has been fun. And um, I know that if I can say that even part of my job has been fun, I'm a pretty lucky person. And I hope that I am in the room with several other people who maybe consider part, if not all of their job, just a little bit fun. And if it's not fun, find work that is fun. Because if we're all doing fun work in the world, I think this world would be a better place. Um, if any of you are curious, I don't have a solid plan, <laughs> um, but I'm going to be doing some contract work in Dominica um, with sperm whale education. I'm not going to be educating the sperm whales, but hopefully <laughs> the people who deal with the sperm whales. Um, I'm going to be working for IFA, which is the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and I'm going to be spending the spring traveling around southern Africa heading back to Dominica in May, and then my brother's wedding in June in LA. So after June, I have no idea what I'm doing. So if you know of any work, just uh, <laughs> you have my contact information. Um, I'm also a blogger, so in a shameless plug of self-promotion, um, I've left the link to my blog out on the table. So when you put your surveys in, there's little slips of paper, and it says nomadamorphos.blogspot.com. So I'm going to be writing about my crazy adventures, so feel free to, to follow and, and and keep up with me. Um, whew, okay, I got through that. All right, so <laughs> Dr. Kathleen Hunt received her doctorate in zoology in 1997 from the University of Washington. Her PhD research focused on the time-honored question, does testosterone really make you aggressive? And to answer this question, she spent five springs in the far northern Arctic tundra following birds around and giving them tiny testosterone implants. 
1998, Dr. Hunt became a staff scientist at the Center for Conservation Biology in Seattle, where she worked for seven years developing fecal hormone assays and fecal DNA analyses for dozens of endangered and rare species, including African elephant, grizzly bear, black bear, Malayan, Malayan, did I say the right? Malayan sun bear, elk, wolverine, northern spotted owl, yellow baboon, stellar sea lion, orca, and many others. While in Seattle, Dr. Hunt began collaborating with the New England Aquarium to develop fecal analyses. I love that fecal's in this so many times, it's just great. Um, for studying reproduction and stress in the northern Atlantic right whale. In 2001, she moved to Boston to help the aquarium develop a new marine stress research initiative. 2010. It's actually very in 2010, this oh, year. Okay, all right. Focusing on the causes and consequences of stress in marine wildlife. This research initiative involves a great deal of fecal hormone analysis, all of which means that there is now a large number of whale poop samples on the fifth floor of the aquarium. <laughs> so, you learn something new every day here. Dr. Hunt also teaches biology at the university level and writes for several college biology textbooks. She also studies sea turtles and continues to squeeze in a bit of bird research and elephant research on the side. So, everybody welcome Dr. Hunt. So, yeah, I just got to the aquarium this year after quite a while working in Seattle on a lot of um, non-whales. So, I've really mostly been a terrestrial biologist for most of my life. And we've um, started up a wonderful research program here. It's really an extension of a program we've been doing for some time. But now we've had to set up our own lab and expand the research program. And I'm delighted to be here. So I thought what I would talk to you about today is um, why we're so fascinated with whale poop, why we think it's um, a good idea to collect it and study it, what we're trying to accomplish, and, um, and how I got into this. Because I got into it on kind of a funny path coming from a lot of other different species. So. Um, the real problem is, as many of you know, the, um, the sea today is not an easy place to live. There's a lot of, um, is he okay? There's <laughs> still people squeezing in the sides. There's a, um, a lot of man-made problems in the ocean now that are affecting pretty much every marine wildlife species. We have a lot of good people working on a lot of these problems, many of them here at the New England Aquarium. And some of the problems are fairly obvious. You can tell if you see a whale entangled in a fishing line, a turtle dead in a shrimp trawl net. The whale on the far right has been um, hit by the propeller of a boat. There's a series of propeller scars on the whale's back. Those problems are pretty obvious. You, you know when you see those animals something um, is drastically wrong. There's a lot of other problems, though, that are a lot less obvious, and those are actually the ones that I'm interested in. There are um, a, lot of, a lot of different subtle problems in the oceans that might not kill the animal immediately, but can affect it uh, pretty severely anyway by making it stressed and decreasing its reproduction and decreasing its um, uh, expected lifespan. For example, there's um, a lot of interest now in sound problems in the ocean. Military sonar, shipping noise, um, seismic exploration, all makes a lot of noise in the ocean today, and that may be affecting a lot of marine mammals in subtle ways that are not necessarily immediately obvious. Um, there's a lot of other repeated stressors, uh, things that stress animals, stressors that animals have to put up with. For example, getting uh, repeatedly surrounded by tuna per seine nets. Maybe these dolphins aren't getting caught, but they have to deal with the stress of being surrounded by the nets frequently. There's um, sewage outflow pipes like this one shown in the far right that pump out a lot of um, toxins and pollutants that also can affect the animals. So what I'm interested in really is how can we figure out how badly these problems are affecting the animals before the problems get too severe. So I was looking for ways to try to assess what stresses out animals, basically. Um, before it gets so bad that it actually kills them. So my approach to this, uh, some of my illustrations are going to come out a little faded, but you can still see it there pretty well. My approach really is to use hormones um, as indicators of stress and health. That's a bear because I actually started doing a lot of this work on bears and elephants. Hormones really can tell us what's going on inside the animal, and hormones are what I mostly um, like about poop. So let me take a moment, 30 seconds, tell you about what a hormone is. So 30 second introduction to endocrinology. A hormone is really just a message. A hormone is a messenger molecule, and it's a molecule that is, is secreted by one organ or tissue in the body, it circulates throughout the bloodstream to the entire body, and other organs notice it coming by and notice when its concentration goes up or goes down, and all those other organs then do something appropriate. 
So really a hormone is a way for one organ to talk to the whole rest of the body and get a really complex body-wide response organized that requires a lot of organs to participate. For example, testosterone. If testosterone levels go up in your typical male vertebrate, um, this is testosterone here, muscle cells, we'll see that testosterone coming, coming by, and they respond by actually growing more muscle fibers. That's why muscles get bigger um, when you have high testosterone. The brain sees the testosterone coming by. It responds in a variety of ways, often by increasing mating behaviors, which sometimes includes aggression, not always. Sometimes includes song or display. Um, if you're a human, skin cells on the chin would respond by growing beard hairs. So every organ has its different response, but they all have some way that they're going to respond. So um, that's an example of a hormone, and it's one of the ones I'm going to be talking about. So look at this hormone for a second. It's got these um, four interlocked rings. Um, this is a steroid hormone, and steroids are actually a class of hormones. They've all got those four interlocked rings, which makes them very stable. It's hard for them, it's hard to break them down. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, that means that they're easy to measure in poop because they survive in poop. Steroid hormones turn out to be the easiest hormones to measure in wildlife, so I really like studying them. So, I want to give you a brief introduction to the four hormones that I've been studying the most with the whales. Um, number one is testosterone. Um, yes, so actually I got this picture because when I was giving a similar talk earlier this year, I actually did a Google image search on the word testosterone, trying to find the molecular structure, and this was the number one hit. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's a great uh, hormone to use in wildlife because it's a really good index in, uh, for breeding condition of males. It can tell you whether an animal is a male or not. It can tell you whether it's in breeding condition. I can only speculate as to whether Arnold here is in breeding condition. Um, the really interesting thing to me is almost all the other vertebrates use the exact same molecule. So, for example, this little bird here, his mouth is open, he's singing. This is the bird I was studying in Alaska. Um, he's singing because his testosterone is high, and it's the exact same molecular structure as the testosterone that we use. In his mind, he thinks he's <laughs> So the uh, hormones are the same across virtually all the vertebrates, um, including fish, amphibians, reptiles, and the birds and the mammals. That's really great news for wildlife studies, because it means you can take analytic techniques that were developed for human blood, and you can use them on fish, on whales, on iguanas, and they'll usually work. So steroid hormones are really great for wildlife studies. So um, going on with the other hormones that I find very useful for wildlife, uh, number two is the estrogens. So this is actually a class of related hormones. Um, the one that's illustrated up there is the one that's most important for most mammals, 17 beta estradiol. But there's some other related ones too, and I call them all the estrogens. So these have turned out to be very useful for um, assessing female reproductive condition. It can tell you whether an animal is a female. And then it's really good for telling you if a female is cycling or not, if she's going through regular estrus cycle. We, we, we don't call it menstrual cycles in um, other mammals because other mammals don't menstruate, but we call it an estrus cycle instead. And it can also tell you if an animal is lactating. And I've actually done a lot of work on estrogen in other animals, and these are the two projects I've been and actually continue to be involved with um, right now. So just for example, this is a Malayan sun bear. Her name's Suntil. She lives at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. Um, she was part of a long study we did using estrogen and also a couple other hormones to figure out um, when she was starting a cycle and when she was about to ovulate. And in fact, if you see here, she's, um, her belly's shaved and her arm is shaved because we had just um, been doing ultrasound and tried AI on her. And we were able to time the AI based on her estrogen levels using an assay that had been developed for human estrogen. So see how great there is at the wildlife studies. And we ended up um, developing a set of ovulation tests for sun bears um, that way, using estrogens. The elephant over there, her name is Rose Two. Her cap is Samudra. Um, I studied those two animals for the last several years in Portland, Oregon. And the little Samudra there is lactating. Rose Two has very high estrogen because she's lactating. And so if you see a, a wild animal with prolonged high estrogen, it's usually a lactating mother. It's really good for assessing lactation. And we have actually a paper um, that just got accepted on um, using estrogen as to assess cycles of elephants, Asian elephants. So those are also great for wildlife studies. And the third reproductive hormone, progesterone, this one is the pregnancy hormone. This is actually rose two again. And um, I had two elephants now that I've done progesterone assays on every single day through their entire pregnancy until they gave birth. Um, progesterone is a fantastic hormone for assessing pregnancy in wildlife. It's, it's usually the best pregnancy test for wild animals. Also did a short study on feral horses as well. So um, other vertebrates that um, don't get pregnant also actually use progesterone. Birds, for example, use progesterone to do um, nest building and parental care. So all three of those hormones 
are, for re are really involved in reproduction. And um, as we'll see, it turns out you can use them in whales too. There's a fourth hormone that's really about something else entirely. Court, the stress hormone. Um, this is actually a class of hormones called the glucocorticoids. They're put out by your adrenal gland when you are stressed. I thought this was a really excellent picture of a stressed animal. And that actually, we're actually a really good photograph series of this poor cat that was trying to fight off five dogs at once and really stressed out of its mind. So I'm, I'm sure this cat's court level is extremely high right now. So what happens when you are under almost any kind of stressor? It could be an attack like this. It could be that you're starving. It could be that you're cold. It could be that you're just anxious. Um, all kinds of different stressors often cause, almost always, cause your body to um, trigger a generalized response that involves the adrenal gland putting out court. And what court really does is it tells the whole body, go into emergency mode. And specifically what that means is it's saying to the whole body, bring your blood glucose up, send it to the muscles, and shut everything else down. And also become very alert. So court raises your blood glucose. Uh, most of that glucose feeds the muscles so that you can try to fight or escape. And um, if this goes on for a long time, it actually can be kind of, um, kind of bad for you because court does shut everything else down. Court does tell the whole body, right now concentrate on escaping, don't do anything non-essential. That means court shuts down reproduction um, pretty severely. It shuts down the immune system, it shuts down bone remodeling, it shuts down wound healing, it shuts down everything except what you need to deal with the emergency. So it's great in the short term. This cat got away. That's the same cat. <laughs> and that was the last slide of the series. And I'm sure its court is sky high and it got away. But if your cord is high for a long time, you really can run into problems because of the shutdown of reproduction and, and the immune system and the other systems that get shut down. So um, that's cord. There's actually two major hormones involved there, corticosterone and cortisol, but I'll just call them both cord for now. So um, you can see now why those four hormones are so useful to measure stress and health and reproduction in wildlife. The thing is, though, you, um, till recently, you've always needed a blood sample to do this. So for example, when I was working on birds, you bleed a bird like this, that's a little tiny drop of blood we're getting out of its wing vein. This illustration over here is a Malayan sun bear getting a blood sample taken out of its um, front leg. Um, however, you can't get blood from a whale. Um, that's always been to me one of the most fascinating things about trying to study whales is that you can't actually get a sample from them to study hormones or to study almost any of the other things that we're accustomed to using blood for in any other animal. Think about it for a second. There's no way to catch a whale alive. There's no way to catch a whale alive. You can catch an elephant. You can catch a giraffe. You can catch a grizzly bear. You can't catch a whale. Not alive. And you can't get a blood sample from it. Not while it's alive. At least no one's managed to do so um, yet with any regularity. regularity. So there's been this sort of mystery about the whales where we just don't know what's going on in their body. We get this brief glimpse of their behavior when they come up to breathe. We can tell a few things then. Then they disappear. And we have really have no idea what's going on inside their body. But you can get poop. <laughs> so this was the great discovery of Rosalind Rolland, who is, where are you, Roz? Put your hand up. OK, Roz, who is a vet. Now, vets understand the value of poop. Roz noticed that we could get poop. And she saw it floating in the water. And she had the bright idea of actually picking it up. And this came, brings me to revelation number one which is, turns out that poop is loaded with hormones. Loaded with hormones. Why is it loaded with hormones? So in, um, it turns out in all the mammals and pretty much all the vertebrates, the hormones that are circulating around in your body don't stay there forever. Your body actually clears them out regularly. Otherwise, you know, the message would stay forever. You want to clear it out so you can uh, listen to new messages, right? So the hormones are circulating around in the blood, and uh, the liver is constantly taking those hormones back out of the blood and the liver uh, breaks them down and gets rid of them by putting most of them into the bile and excreting it into the gut. So most of the steroid hormones in particular end up in the gut with the food that you ate. And um, there are some complications. Some of them can get reabsorbed back into the blood. But for the most part, most of the steroid hormones come out of the poop. They've been changed a little bit. Um, we call them fecal metabolites, of, um, meaning breakdown products of the steroid hormones. But um, there's a lot of it there. So. <laughs> yes, this is an actual zoo that had trained an elephant to sit on a gigantic toilet. <laughs> I, I knew this was the talk where I could finally use the technology. So we had learned from other animals around through the um, late 80s and into the 90s, 
several different teams, including the team I was working with in Seattle, started seeing, started realizing that there was a lot of hormone in poop, and we started looking for the reproductive hormones. And we found out these other, these facts with, with a lot of species. The steroid hormones are changed a little bit in the poop. Sometimes they're changed a lot, but they're still detectable. And the methods we use to analyze the blood actually still can detect the, these hormone breakdown products in the poop. Uh, another thing that, uh, that turned out to be very interesting is the poop has much more hormone than in the blood. If you have um, a little bit of blood, like about um, about a drop, you know, just a drop of blood about the size of, say, um, a raisin, about a mil, milliliter, and you have the same volume of poop, the poop will have a thousand times or more more hormone in it than that drop of blood will. Why is that? It's because the, the poop actually takes a while to go through the gut. Poops take a while to come through, and they take a day or two in most species. And during that time, they're kept collecting all the hormone that's been cleared out of the blood, cleared out of the blood, cleared out of the blood. It all ends up piling up in that poop. And finally, when the poop um, finally comes out the other end, it's got basically all the hormone of the previous couple of days. I'm simplifying things a, a little bit, but that'll give you the idea. This also means that poop hormones actually don't, are, don't fluctuate very much. They don't respond very, very much to brief fluctuations in hormone levels in the blood. If an animal has a little spike of progesterone that just lasts for a second, you won't notice that in the poop later. What the poop really tells you is the average overall level. It can tell you about long-term chronic changes. It can also tell you about subtle long-term changes that you sometimes miss in blood. And the last thing is, because poop has so much more hormone than blood, I found actually that there's several hormones that are so low you can't even detect them very well at all in the blood that you can measure really easily in the poop. So poop is great. So with the whales, uh, what we found is that the poop um, floats. It's bright orange. It has an ungodly stink, which helps you find it. And you can scoop it up to the surface with a net. This turned out to be the case with the North Atlantic right whales. Not all whales have poop that floats, but we were lucky the right whales do. So um, Roz and the whole right whale team started scooping up the poop. And um, they've got hundreds and hundreds of fecal samples um, to date. We've been doing this since 1999. We just got done with our 2011 season. And all of these fecal samples are on the fifth floor of the aquarium. So there's a lot of poop on the fifth floor. Now, most of these samples we've gotten from the same couple months, August and September, when we do our field work up in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and what I'm going to show you next is um, the results from our first big analysis that we did about halfway through the study which was about 95 samples that we, where we knew which whale had actually provided that fecal sample, or we were fairly confident of our identification of that whale, and we knew something about the history of that whale. So um, just as a PS, Roz also used one other method besides nets to collect the poop. She's um, figured out you can retrain, you can train scenting dogs and put them on a bow of a boat, and they can sniff out the scent of a floating poop up to a uh, nautical mile away on the wind and can lead you to it. So um, you've got a whole paper out about that. If you're curious about that, ask her more later. It's a fantastic technique. So using both the net and the dog, we got a bunch of poops. The first question was, um, can we detect the reproductive hormones? And if so, does it tell us anything? So um, first one, progesterone. So down here we have, these are whales where we know their reproductive status. And this is showing you just our female whales who are in one of four categories. There's juveniles, adults that were not lactating or pregnant, we call them resting females lactating females who are nursing a calf, and finally on the right, the pregnant uh, females, and you can see we have a pregnancy test for red whales. It's, um, it's astoundingly um, hot, higher progesterone in the pregnant whales than in any other category. This is a log scale here that's an extraordinarily high concentration of progesterone. So high that when I got the first result from one of the pregnant whales, I thought the assay wasn't working for right whales, and then we found out that was a pregnant female. It all came into place. So, um, pregnancy test for whales. Estrogen, same four categories here. Juvenile, resting females, lactating and pregnant. Pregnant females had high estrogen. That was expected. They usually do. But what I was really thrilled with is that the lactating females had a significantly higher estrogen than the resting and the juveniles. We can identify a lactating female. She'll have low progesterone and high estrogen, right? So that'll tell us it's a lactating female. Here's the testosterone in the males, and this was also a total thrill. We did manage to get some juvenile males and some adult males, and the adults have significantly higher testosterone than the juveniles, which makes sense, but I was thrilled. It means the acid is working for whales. It means it's really telling us something about what's really happening in that whale's body. It also gives us a good way to really assess whether a male who is of reproductive age really is in breeding condition or not. And sometimes we'll find, say, a, a juvenile who's right on the edge of being a reproductive age, and 
occasionally one of those will turn up with high testosterone. I'm telling you, he might have already come into breeding condition. So um, one last thing, we found we could put the testosterone and the estrogen data together and sex a whale. So here's um, testosterone, it says androgens, that's the class of hormones that testosterone falls into. Um, the androgens on, this, on the y-axis, the estrogens on the x-axis. Guess which is the males and which is the females. The uh, males are the black triangles, higher testosterone than, than estrogen. The females are all circles. And we can, uh, by using the ratio of testosterone to estrogen, we can ID the sex of an unknown whale with a very high degree of accuracy. And if you're curious, that's the, um, the paper where all this information is published. These figures are drawn directly from that paper. So we can, uh, we can sex an unknown whale now. So at this point, I was starting to have revelation number two, which was poop is better than blood. Because as, as a, um, I was relatively new to poop research still when this study started in 1999. I was just two years out of my PhD. And I was still in the mindset of, oh, we have to prove that poop is as good as blood. We have to compare the poop results to the blood results. And I still, whenever I run into people who are new to poop, new, not converts yet, <laughs> they always start saying, well, how are we, can we correlate the poop results to the blood results? And I finally got to the point where I'm like, no, 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 no. Poop is better. Poop is the standard. Blood is inferior. So here's one of the major reasons. I had not mentioned the stress hormone yet. So think about studying stress in wildlife with blood. One of the major reasons poop is better than blood um, is that to get a blood sample, you stress the animal, right? So there's two problems with that. One is it's just not nice. I mean, it's actually not good for the animal to go through the experience of being caught and having a blood sample taken. This deer's court level, this is a deer's part of a research study. It's going to have a blood sample taken and a radio collar put on. And I guarantee you its cord is through the roof right now. So, um, so that's just not good for the animal. But the second reason is, is, uh, relates to the quality of the data you're getting. If you're trying to measure what that animal's court level was, you've just changed the thing you were trying to measure. What you're measuring is its response to being captured, not how, how its court level was earlier. So that had been um, actually a really severe problem in studying wildlife stress. And if you look back in the science literature, you'll find there weren't that many studies on wildlife stress before about the mid-90s. Um, mid because um, nobody could figure out a way to study the stress hormones without stressing the animal out and affecting the thing that they were trying to study. And this is actually a big problem if you're trying to assess effects of human disturbance in the environment on wild animals. It, there wasn't really a good way to do it. So um, the thing about fecal cord is um, the assays hadn't yet been developed for fecal cord in mammals at the time I started doing this work. So the team I was working with in Seattle, we took it upon ourselves with a whole lot of other wonderful collaborators to um, get a fecal cord assay running for vertebrates. And we picked an assay that we thought might work, and we tested it on every one of these species. This is all in that paper. This took years and years and years and years. And basically what we did with every one of these animals is we gave each of these animals, or several for each species, an injection of the pituitary hormone that makes cord go high, that makes the adrenal gland release cord. So we knew for sure that their cord and their blood would be high right after we gave them that injection. And then we collected their poops and measured what came out in the poops. And sure enough, in every single animal, about one day later, you got a big spike in cord coming out of the poop. So what we'd shown really is that the fecal cord assay really was finding a cord, and it really was telling us that the animal had had a big spike of cord in its blood, and that it really was working. So it worked for all these anim animals, um, mostly mammals, and one bird. And the bird was really exciting. This was the northern spotted owl, which is um, still a highly endangered bird, and the sort um, the focus of a huge amount of work in the Pacific Northwest. And it was really exciting it worked for the bird because that told us it might work for a lot of other vertebrates besides mammals, which has turned out to be the case. So um, it's hard getting a new assay. To get any new science technique working is a lot of work. So we did this gigantic study, and then we did all these other studies on all these other aspects of measuring fecal cord in all these species. And I became very, very, very familiar with um, poop. <laughs> this is really my... <laughs> Um, my initiation into the world of poop, and I had um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subsamples of grizzly bear and elephant poop. I had thousands of elephant poops in different conditions of sun and rainfall. I would go in and rain on them with a little watering can every day. I, I managed to miss, and luckily I was not part of the study that my friend um, Sam was in, in which he, he had the all-time winter experience of having to stand knee-deep in a dumpster full of radioactive elephant poop 
for two hours in the summer sun, stirring it up till it was thoroughly homogenized. And I won't go into the details of why he was doing that, but I was just glad that study had happened already by the time I started in the lab. So we really worked on this, and we got the technique really working well, and it's something I'm proud of. So um, now look, so I, went, I just went and Googled uh, fecal glucoparicoid assays in Google Scholar. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers out now using this assay and a couple other assays now too in all of these different species, and it's become one of the most common ways to study stress in wildlife, and it's really been wonderful. It's really opened the field wide up, wide open. And notice we do have now um, reptiles, there's an iguana over there, parrotfish, it works for fish, it's been used in a lot of birds now too, works for just about all the vertebrates, so it's been fantastic. So this is when I had another revelation. Um, People tend to get grossed out when I talk about the fact that I work with poop. And what I found, walking around and collecting all these poops from all these species, is that the world is covered in poop. You are walking over poop dust all the time. The whole world is coated with poop dust, and the ocean is full of poop particles. And just don't worry about it. Just, <laughs> just accept that poop is everywhere, and it's part of life. Okay, so I totally got over any... Um, Ooginess that I had about poop, and now I just totally love poop. And so then my next question was, uh, will it work in whales? So we did fecal corn, that same fecal corn assay in the North Atlantic right whale samples, the same one that we had, the same samples that we had all that reproductive data for. And right away we saw really beautiful patterns with uh, fecal corn being different in the different age sex classes of the animals. For example, um, for example, pregnant females tend to have really high fecal corn, and so do mature males. And that really makes sense, because actually, when you think about it, not all stress is bad. And in fact, there's two, this is the plastic, in fact, the two stressors that actually are kind of good are pregnancy. Pregnancy is stressful. And being a mature animal trying to find a mate, a lot of these mature males, we got proof from them at the time of year that they were um, trying to participate in these gigantic, very chaotic groups of whales that are rolling around at the surface together. It's called surface active groups. And I've been in the middle of those surface active groups now, and I can say that it's stressful to me, and I can imagine it's probably stressful for the males to try to be in the middle of all this wild social activity. That's a good kind of stress, right? Breeding is a good kind of stress. Pregnancy is a good kind of stress. But it does raise your cord. So uh, it made sense that those two groups of animals would have high cord. Um, so that was interesting. And our next question really was, what about the bad kinds of stress? Would you also see cord going up? with the bad kinds of stress. And pretty soon in the study, we had, unfortunately, a really good example, a really good case study to try. Um, in 2001, there's a, a, a whale who became very badly entangled. He's by the name of Churchill. And there was um, a, a really prolonged effort to try to get the entanglement of, of the fishing line off of him. This is Churchill's fluke here. And I don't know if you can see, but he's, he is looking in horrible shape. He has all these um, white scars on him from the lines. And can you see a little bit orange there? He's becoming covered with these uh, little orange invertebrates called cyamids, and that's a bad sign. Uh, right whales are not supposed to be covered with those, and it tends to happen only when they're really not doing well. So um, he was getting very thin. Um, so um, fortunately, the disentanglement team happened to spot a poop when they're trying to get these lines off Churchill, and though unfortunately, unfortunately we were not able to get all the lines off of Churchill, <coughs> fortunately we did at least get the poop. I always feel kind of bad about this. That, I feel really bad about what happened at Churchill, but I'm also really glad we got a sample from him because it helped us figure out whether this method was going to work for other whales that hopefully we will be able to help. So Churchill disappeared <coughs> forever, we think. We think he died. Um, there's his court level. At the time, it was the highest court level we'd ever recorded for North Atlantic right whale. So he was really, a, he was definitely a stressed animal, and he had really high fecal court. Um, so this was a sad story, but it, made us at least feel pretty good about our assay. We thought we, we could use this assay to measure stress in whales. And it's the first time we would had a really good way of measuring the, the physiological effects of stress, the real stress inside your body. R.I.P. Churchill. So um, we've now moved forward and it's funny, it looks, a lot of these look great on this laptop here, but the um, brightness on the monitor is completely blurring out most of this graph. But I'll describe to you what's going on. Basically, we have a new statistical method that a colleague of ours named Peter Corkman has developed to try to analyze all this data. And he has developed, um, he's using a method called conditional inference trees, or as he calls them, poo trees, because he uses it for poo data. <laughs> and basically, the idea is that you put all the data from all four hormones all together, all of your data, 
including the information on the whale's age and sex, into the computer, and then you ask the computer, okay, of all this hormone data, what's the most useful piece? What's the bit of hormone data that does the best job at discriminating one type of animal, one age, sex cla class from the others? And, and then what's the next most useful piece of data after that? And so it's, it identifies a group of whales and then looks for the next most useful piece of data and so on and so on. Basically what it found is that the first most useful piece is progesterone, which we kind of knew. The animals with really high progesterone are the pregnant females. So you pull the pregnant females out. Now that you look at your remaining data, what's the next most informative piece of data? It turns out to be the testosterone. Of your remaining whales, the ones with high testosterone are the adult males. You pull those whales out, you keep going and you keep going. And these, uh, these groups of animals start falling out of your data set. And what we <laughs> noticed was the fourth, fourth set of animals to fall out was a set of animals that had high court. Seven whales with anomalously high court. So we look, took a closer look at what exactly was going on with those seven animals. And in at least six of those seven cases, there was a known, basically a known stressor, a known unusual thing affecting those whales. So we had two females who were nursing their first calf, the first calf they'd ever had, which you can imagine is probably stressful. A female in the middle of a six-year calving interval. So right whales usually um, have calves every three years. So she was due to have a calf in the middle there, and she didn't probably something happened. She might have had a baby and lost it for some reason, or she might have not gotten pregnant at all for some reason. We don't know exactly, but it's unusual for them to go six years. So something may have happened to her right around then. We had an immature whale that we later found out had a, um, a lot of parasitic infections. We had a female killed by a ship strike. So I've had the question before about if they're dead, why are they stressed? But actually what happens, unfortunately, is often the whales, when they're killed by ship strikes, often they don't die right away. And they've, they've had a really bad impact, they have broken bones, and they linger for a while, and that's definitely stressful. And then they die. And then we had one case of this really unusual male who had um, low testosterone, he actually didn't go to the breeding grounds. In fact, he turned up in Norway, which is really bizarre, uh, and didn't seem to be breeding that year, and he was kind of thin. We don't really know why he was uh, in Norway, in um, waters by Norway, but it was definitely a weird thing for him to do, so probably something <coughs> stressful going on with him. The um, seventh animal we don't know much about, apparently healthy and mature. So if you look at the data overall, in six or seven cases, something unusual was going on. So we, we think this is another good piece of evidence that we really can measure stress in these animals now, which has never been possible before. We've just completed a new, um, a new set of analyses that tried, in which we tried to link the fecal court level to the appearance of the whale. So when whales start getting ill or, or getting very sick, they, um, you can see that happening to them. The contour of their body starts to change as they start using up their blubber. Their skin starts getting covered with lesions. And you can see lesions in the top picture over there. So here's a healthy whale. Here's a whale covered with lesions. Here's a whale that has lost some of its blubber and has a sort of depression instead of being a convex outline concave outline, and they can start getting covered with those uh, little orange cyanides that I pointed out on Churchill. So um, we have several people um, here, Heather, is Heather here somewhere? Okay. Heather put together this um, really nice way of categorizing this formally, having a scoring system for assessing the visual health status of these animals, and we took that data that she put together and tied it to our fecal court data, and sure enough, fecal court tends to be uh, higher in the animals that have worse scores for visual health. This is significant for the mature males in particular, statistically significant. Um, for some of the other groups, we don't have a great sample size yet, so we'll keep looking at that as more data comes in. So uh, again, the people court is working great. To uh, sum up where we are right now, look at all the stuff we learned from poop. We've got the sex of the whale, pregnancy test, we can tell whether females are lactating, uh, we can tell if males are mature or not. We can tell all kinds of information we think now about whether they're stressed and uh, various reasons why they might be stressed. Entanglement, health status, unusual life events. Um, plus, Roz has um, gone to town with a bunch of other fantastic analyses and found there's all kinds of other information in the poop too. You can get parasit information on parasites, toxins, diet content, and you can get DNA, the whale's DNA. So, another revelation. Poop is a gold mine from a biologist's <laughs> point of view. And I really feel this way now. It's gotten to the point where if I walk around and see like dog poop, 
the first thought that comes to mind is, what can I learn from that? <laughs> and I, even, I, I seriously have said to my friends, I, I think of poop now as samples. I, I have this called a sample. And I have literally said to friends, look out, don't step in the sample. <laughs> Not on purpose, it's just, it just comes out that way. So um, it's really a gold mine. It really makes you look at things differently. So I just found one more thing we can get out of the poop. Um, just on Monday, I found out we can get thyroid hormones out of right whale poop too. The right whales turn out to be right whale poop loaded with thyroid hormone. This is a hormone from the thyroid gland here in the neck. It's in the neck on whales too, even though they don't have much of a neck. It's in the same place. Um, and this is the hormone that primarily drives metabolic rate, how fast your body is running throughout your entire body. And that tends to correlate with how active you are and whether you have enough food and enough body fat. So this is a um, really exciting discovery. I'm not going to explain this graph in great detail other than to say this is the first test you do when you're trying out a new assay and that the lines should be parallel. And if the lines are parallel, the assay's working. So the lines are parallel, the assay's working, and I'm really happy. And that's all I'll say about that. So stay tuned for more thyroid hormone data from the right whales. So um, that kind of wraps up where we are at the right whales. I want to take my last few minutes and just tell you about what we're, um, what we're doing now. And what we really think has happened is that we found a way to open this mysterious black box of whale physiology so that we can look inside the whale's body and see what's really going on with them. It's worked so fantastically for the right whales, and we're now um, thinking we're ready to bring this method to other species of whales and other species of non-whales as well. So um, we are delighted to tell you that we now have a fantastic, beautifully new renovated lab on the fifth floor, um, which we are calling the Prescott Lab, and we also have a fantastic new research assistant, Jody. Um, and we are storming ahead with lots and lots of fecal assays now. And our first job is to catch up on all the right whale poops that we've had in storage for the past several years. There they all are. There are the dilutions Jody made. Jody's just holding a little right whale stuff toy to tell you the right whale samples. So um, it's really exciting to finally get going on all these assays um, and getting right up to date with 2011 samples. And we're bringing it to new whales. So we've got a new project now that we've started to study the possible effects of military sonar noise on whales in the Bahamas particularly the deep diving whales, which are the most affected by sonar noise, and particularly beaked whales, which are notoriously sensitive to sonar noise. If you've never heard of a beaked whale or never seen one, this is the one we're working on. Um, they have this peculiar jaw with the males have little teeth on the top of their lower jaw that they use for scraping each other up in fights. That's a photo of a male's head, cute little teeth there, and that's what they look like if you could see the whole body. So. Um, we have gone down for the first field season in July um, to work with a wonderful set of coll collaborators, um, Diane Claridge and Charlotte Dunn at the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization. And they have an incredible long-term study they're doing on beak whales and sperm whales and other deep divers of the Bahamas. And they are able to find these whales, which is astonishing right then, and get right next to them and follow them. And they do this by towing snorkelers in the water next to the boat. This is actually Scott in the water here. I think in this, I think this is from the day when I'm the snorkeler on the other side of the boat, or maybe it was Roz. Anyway, we were in the water being towed along with these beaked whales. Um, and we can point, see Scott pointing there, point to tell the boat pilot if the whale's underwater or changing direction. So the boat can stay with the whales. Because you can't see them that well when you're out of the water. And then, you can see him poop. And then you actually free dive down and you scoop up the poop with a Ziploc bag. And this is just one of these things I never thought I'd be doing in my life. And this led me to Revelation number four, which is that poop research is the coolest time ever. I'm so glad I'm doing it. Um, we're also getting fecal samples with sperm whales that we don't go swimming with the sperm whales. Um, that, that poop is just scooped up from the surface by Dan and Charlotte. And they just ship us a bunch of poops. These are um, again, it's blurred out a little bit, but if you could see what that circle is around, it says MD fecal, the Zoplodon densirostris fecal, that's a beaked whale fecal sample, which has got to be one of the rarest fecal samples in the world. And I'm actually really excited that we have these samples. Can't wait to get going on them. So um, we also have, um, are hoping to do new projects with grants in on humpback whales, and we have a plan for bulkhead whales to see if we can get these same sorts of reproductive and stress hormone assays working for these two species as well. And um, we are expanding beyond poop. We, and I'll just use my last couple slides to tell you um, that we do do non-poop. I'm branching out. I now also do blow, which has a whole other set of jokes associated with it that I won't get into right now. Uh, I pick my projects by their pun potential, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so this is actually uh, Roz and Scott, and I'm on the book too. We're collecting respiratory vapor, blow, from 
free swimming right whales in the Bay of Fundy. We got 35 samples, which I think is amazing. And, uh, excuse me, 55 samples, which I think is amazing. 35 would have been amazing. And 55 is what we actually got. And this week I actually detected hormone in um, my first set, in my first assay for corticosterone. So there's hormone in those samples, which is, gonna, is really, really thrilling. Um, we're also planning to expand, expand beyond, <laughs> beyond whales. We um, are doing a big project on the sea turtles that often wash up stunned every fall in Cape Cod that end up at our rehabilitation center. And we're likely to um, start working on other non-whales in the future too, birds, fish, other things. So we're hoping to expand this into a really substantial research program on stress and health assessment in marine wildlife of all kinds using our fantastic new lab. So um, I promised you the meaning of life, right? So we'll put the meaning of life. The lowliest, most humble thing, maybe just the thing you need. These are things I've learned working in health, right? There is nothing to fear except fear itself and thanks to olfactory habituation. So everyone is always scared of working with food because they think it's going to stink and the fantastic thing is that you get so you can't smell it anymore. <laughs> really great. Nothing stinks like success. That's one of my favorite just general quotes. No matter how weird your life is, it will soon get even weirder. That's what I've found is part of the meaning of my life at any way. One man's poop is another man's gold mine. But the big one, and this one is actually serious, is I always kind of find it kind of funny how funny people think it is that I work with poop. And I'll be talking to someone who works in a, I don't know, a, a bank or a restaurant, you know, perfectly fine jobs. But um, and they ask me what I do, and I say I work with whale poop, and they start laughing automatically, and then we get into a whole thing about it. Um, there's, I can have a whole other talk about conversations I've had about talking with people about working with whale poop. But the thing that always strikes me is that I feel like I'm so privileged to get to work with this poop because I've had the opportunity to make a difference. I have a skill in this funny field of fecal hormones and I found out that it's really, really useful for actually helping the marine wildlife that are so desperately need in every, of every bit of assistance that we can give them. So I feel like I'm the lucky one. I've got the, the better job. I've been able to make a difference and I'm thrilled to be able to work with whale poop. So make a difference whatever way you can, even with, if it's with poop. That's the meaning of life. So um, my acknowledgments here. <laughs> like I said, sometimes I wonder if they think that. The animals are protecting But more seriously, I want to thank all my collaborators. Rod and Scott have been on board with this the whole entire time. They work with me on everything. Sam Wasser is my colleague in Seattle who got me started with poop. Babahamra's Marine Mammal Research Organization, and all of those who picked up poop for us, thank you so much, and our funders, which right now primarily the Office of Naval Research, and also our wonderful donors who helped us together the Prescott Lab. So, um, any questions? That's it. <laughs> I just want to show you the top ten list because uh, <laughs> I think people should know. camel, really bad. African elephant, which um, sometimes isn't so bad, it kind of depends a bit on the elephant. Here we're starting to get into the carnivores a little bit, black bear, wolverine. The carnivores are worse. So my first five years working with the North Atlantic right whale, it was it was up there. It was in the top ten. It was really really foul. And then you'll you'll see in a minute my opinion changed. Um, but I would actually put it a little below the stellar sea lion, which had a, 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 a pungency and a sort of rancidness to it. Okay, here we start getting into the really nice The dog, coyote that has eaten blood, grizzly bear that has been eating dying salmon. This is one of my worst studies. And number one, can anybody guess? You got it. <laughs> and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think we have evolved to be repulsed by poop that is the most likely to carry parasites that are dangerous to us, right? That's why I think we think poop smells bad. Um, oh. I best smell poop. <laughs> so the weirdest thing happened. I had been working with right whales for a while and I came here to start up this lab this year and I got right whale poop out of the freezer after a couple years away from it and it smelled sweet. Something has happened to my nose. I can still identify, I'll still be like, there's a whale poop but it doesn't smell bad anymore to me, and I'm so grateful. It's just a nice So I think I literally fried out whatever part of my, part of my nose was smelling the whale poop, the bad part of the whale poop. Um, or so kind of like, if you get into the opinion, um, songbirds. So here we get into the really of scentless poops. Songbirds, rabbit, my favorite, white-tailed teeth. <laughs>